Richard again. Uh, I'm just here to talk about um, a few general things that I've been thinking about. Uh, it's mostly about uh, studying um, the Clay Institute um, problems, the math problems from the Clay Institute. Uh, and I've been looking at a few of them for like about two years now. And uh, I've just recently started to just buckle down and start to really uh, study and uh, and uh, just um, analyze and really think deep about uh, some of the problems and some of them are the, the Hodge conjecture and the Riemann hypothesis and uh, and the Hodge conjecture has to do with you know just like the Poynier conjecture had to do with shapes and everything the Hodge conjecture is more of a compact detailed uh, from what I understand is much more of like much more deeper detailed uh, structures of ge geometric shapes in a complex form uh, and uh, important conjecture uh, it has to do with uh, how to, to determine uh, s complex spaces or curved spaces and you know Gregory Gregory I think his name is uh, Perlman used uh, the the Ricci, uh, Ricci flow and combined it you know with the theory of uh, uh, I think is Henry point point uh, Poinier, whatever his name is, uh, I think uh, he's he's been known for a long time, and so now they could determine the shape of the universe and all that stuff, and so that's a not another that, that's an ultimate that's a real big breakthrough, almost as, you know I think that the Riemann hypothesis and and the Poinier conjecture are both two big things that are connected, you know, and the, um, the Riemann hypothesis is another problem that uh, has to do with prime numbers and uh, how to find the distribution of primes and uh, how you know how to how to determine to predict when a prime will occur I mean a lot of scientists if we didn't know any better we wouldn't even know how to how to determine uh, when number five will come or seven you know that's how bad it is we just don't know how to predict now we do obviously but I mean that was just a like a almost like gravity almost you know like turn up you know this came easy but if we didn't know any better we wouldn't even know how to predict how when the number five will come in when number seven and thirteen will come in you know because a prime the has completed warning red screen crow detected uh, let's forget about that well uh, other, besides that um, you know because um, of the primes they come in and they you know they, they appear one comes in this way, another one comes in this way, another one comes in this way, another one, you know, they're all kind of scattered and spaced apart and some of them are, some of them do come uniformly but a lot of them are very sporadic. And one thing, one thing that I wanted to talk about that I've been thinking about is that prime numbers or the non-trivial zeros, those are the real smallest of the, uh, of the real, uh, what I believe to be, uh, you know, because that that scientists believe that that will help to determine uh, how to better understand and predict the distribution of primes and how to predict when a prime will come. But uh, um, what I believe the non-trivial zeros represent is that not only are they representing what scientists believe is like the quantum energy levels and all this stuff, but I believe that the the Riemann hypothesis also determines um the the non-trivial zeros also determine uh it's basically like my theory my little theory my idea about it is that uh it's like a snowflake like each um prime number is kind of similar how the primes are built how the primes appear how how the non-trivial zeros appear or the primes of both of them uh, they're all unique you know if you were just kind of if you were just if you were to get if you were to cut a section off of a 50 primes you could consider that to be like a snowflake and then another 50 is a, every every uh, spacing between those primes in the 50 that you cut out and separated from could be considered a single snowflake you know and for each 50 that you cut out every snowflake the patterns and the and the and the um, the spacing and the structure and the look of it is completely different like people say all snowflakes are different and I think that primes have to do in nature, not just in my theory, but 
in reality I think that prime numbers and how they're distributed and how they're random is also uh, connected to uh, how how and why snowflakes are all different because what I believe is that from the very roots of life itself everything is not uniform you know like scientists know that nothing's uniform when you go to the quantum level but everything in the quantum level is built ununiformly and it's built ununiformly because it follows the non-trivial zero structure the random structuralization of, of creation itself you know um, like a uh, like like even a manufacturer that makes a plastic ball or like a flower that you know for a better instance is like uh um uh, like when uh, a a uh, uh, blade of grass grows they all look the same some of them are a little bit short and all that but when you go to each of them all of them are in are basically in a, their own universe of of the laws of the non-trivial zero structure pattern creation you know they all follow that uh, ununiform um, building block of their own of their own uh, reality blades and snowflakes follow their own separate universe of the non-trivial zero structure you know everything is built upon you know you can have a like a blade of grass could look very uniform but in the structure nature creates things very kind of half 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 uh hazardly kind of building things on top of each other and everything's kind of entwined and in interconnected and intermangled but when when all of that is just to build something so that when it's finished when it's done being born whatever it is on the when it's built completely from a distance it looks uniform but in the structure itself it follows a haphazardly uh, manifestation of uh, of ununiform non-trivial zero kind of blueprint of uh, creation you know if that makes sense you know um, that's how nature builds things it doesn't build th it does it doesn't build a brick wall by every uniform block like how people do you, you, nature builds uh, life in a very haphazard ununiform way but it can do that because it builds it from the very smallest of the small and so it doesn't really matter if everything is not uniform because if you're building something very small as long as it structurally sounds in the quantum level you could ultimately keep on building upon that and then when you reach a certain mass create a uniform type of uh, uh, completion to it you know and to have it be much more uh, you know uh, just much more um, safely uh, e existing in reality more of a safety safer for it to kind of sustain itself in reality so in the smallest level everything could be wild but when it reaches a critical mass of, uh, of its existence you could then kind of structuralize it you know because it reaches such a big mass that no matter no matter how fickle it may create itself it's still going to be pretty pretty sound and also to um that that's why i believe you know that it's just like a like a mountain like uh, the, the non-trivial zeros and prime they follow like if you look at mountains everything's jagged all the shapes and all the edges are very jagged and nothing is this nothing is similar. Me, you might find a spot here of some jagged patch of rock similar to another jagged patch of rock five miles away, north by northeast or whatever. You know, up here, you know, and uh, you know, a few degrees over there. But you know, it's it, it's just like prime numbers and and uh, non-trivial zeros. Everything kind of seems from a distance. There's going to be some similarities here and there. But everything could be uh, uh, very sporadic. And non-trivial zeros is like every jagged. You could consider that as a appearance of a non-trivial zero. Every jagged, every every hole in a snowflake, it could be considered a, a non-trivial zero. Every um, shred of microscopic quantum uh, blade of grass.
could be considered a non-trivial zero being haphazardly stuck together, you know. And that's what the trivial zeros are. It's the most quantum building blocks of how things are built. Whether it's from the fabric of a, uh, the, the 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 fabric of a uh, um of rocks and the the quantum levels of of life being built, everything follows a in in the quantum in the in the non-trivial zero level, everything follows a very sporadic haphazardly creation. But that's just to lead itself to a larger mass existence, so that. It, it will it doesn't even matter because everything's gonna be so sound at the quantum level it's all being about sound just splashing it together that's what primes are you know and to determine that I think that it's you know uh, I'm still figuring it out but hopefully I will figure it out uh, and uh, uh, I got some ideas and uh, yeah just that just up uh, you know every jagged piece of rock on a mountain is a non-trivial zero sticking out and building itself and right now the mountains like this and the people are like right here almost 25 percent maybe less than that in the mountains like this so like there is an end to it but we just have to work hard and keep on building and finding equations because the only way to determine prime numbers or non-trivial zeros you would have to create a, an equation that is constantly shifting and changing you would switch the negative uh, you would switch the difference down to the bottom and have the multiplication moved over here and then have it be multiplied to have different fractions and like the equation would have to be constantly shifting and changing to, to always determine when the prime will come so it isn't going to be one equation that will give you all the sequences of the primes and non-trivial zeros it would have to be constantly every prime would have to have its own separate equation in order for for you to determine that that is when it's going to happen when it will happen that, that that's how complex it will be that's what I think you know that's how complex it is for number five number two you would have to and number seven and thirteen you have to create your own separate equation for those separate primes so that you can label that as the appearance of that prime and and the corresponding equation that you have to use so that you can you know find it and you know it's very complex you know but I'm thinking about it and everybody's thinking about it so yeah and the uh, Hodge conjecture and the not Clay Institute Clay Institute stuff and they you know all this really interesting stuff and the uh, polynomials um, you know um, the uh, what is it called the Birch Swinnerton Dyer conjecture that's a very good one too that's the one I'm looking at too uh, and uh, you know um, I think that I'm going to be looking at the Hodge conjecture before the Riemann but we'll see what happens I'm still studying in whichever one I feel more uh, that I can solve the quickest and get out there I'll probably get it out there and whichever one I feel more gravitated toward I'll work the hardest toward at the realistically which one you know I was the Hodge the Riemann is way too complex and way too strange but uh, the more I study it you know uh, the more I understand but the Hodge conjecture is shapes and I think that's why the point of conjecture was solved by Gregory Perlman because it has to do with shapes you know and men by nature we grab things with our hands and we build things and I think that Gregory Pillman used uh, that type of uh, natural male instinct but with his mind to solve the shape problem and finding the shape of things with uh, the Ricci flows and all that and uh, yeah and I'll probably do the Hodge conjecture but you know alright thank you this is Rich Cespedes thank you for your time